it, it is all confidential, oh, at least until <laughs> everything in the book becomes reported. <laughs> and that's that's a you know that's even even more valuable tool than like a nuclear bomb, really. I will refrain from talking about the name because I yeah. uh, over here I, I can just by saying I could probably get sued, okay. uh, but. Well, good day, everyone, and welcome back to the Cyber Minutes podcast. My name is Max, and I'm joined by Flynn and our special guest today, Ryan. So, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit, Ryan? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Max. Um, my name's Ryan. I go by the online alias Totally Not a Hacker. I am a 17 year old vehicle cybersecurity researcher who specializes in many different uh, fields of cybersecurity. Um, and I've also written three books. Wow. Such a young age at seventeen, I was still, you know, playing Overwatch twenty four seven. But for our audience, we Ryan reached out to us after our episode with Kerwin. Uh, Kerwin mentioned about how he's such a talented reverse engineering specialist, and um, I kind of reached out to Ryan saying like, "Hey, do you want to come on?" And here we are. So, yeah. Well uh, so being seventeen years old. How did you first get into cybersecurity? What was the first time you went, okay, this is what I want to do? It was, I would have to give it up for the person that dragged me into game hacking in middle school. Um, they, they, they kind of were like, you know, let's find a way to make easier money. And I was like, okay, I don't know what this is, but I'll give it a try. And we spent our time reselling game exploits to mainstream games and eventually got onto creating them or helping create them in a way. Wow, that's insane. How do you how do you even do that? Like how do you even, you know, go into, I don't know, playing like CS, right? Or and just kind of, you know, like reverse engineer it to be able to create something that you're able to create black bootleg sort of cheats out like what's the process for that? Yeah, it really depends on the game. Uh for it depends on the anti-cheat, the protection and everything. Uh again, pretty much just sort of really falling under the game. I guess that's a good way to put it um but for most games it's really just like oh i want to pick this apart like let me figure out what makes my player go to xyz on the coordinate plane in a game and visualizing it in a computational sense it's like instead of just looking at it from a person viewpoint like what are we doing inside of the computer ripping it apart tracing it and then building an exploit that can control those movements through the memory of the game or from inside the game Awesome. So you said before, it depends on the game. Uh, what would you, does your process change depending on what you're targeting? Not even specific game stuff. So just reverse engineering in general. Does it change depending on what you're targeting? Is this is there like a sort of a scoping period beforehand where you kind of look at what you're targeting and how you're going to approach it? Mm, yeah, this actually falls great for because uh, I do reverse engineering in many different applications like vehicle security and IoT and stuff like that. Um, and I've learned to actually approach it from a more logical concept slash theory standpoint. Basically, we take the thing we're going to reverse engineer and we're like, how does this work in the environment? Let's use it like a user and let's figure out what we can rip apart and answer a few questions. Does it need internet connection? Is it responding to a server? Does it sanitize user input and so on from there? And then you can tear it apart, trace it and apply the methodology to pretty much anything. Yeah. Awesome. So just another question. So, you know, you mentioned reverse engineering a couple times. Would you say that's like your best sort of skill or would you say it's, you know, the one that you're most used to using or, you know, are there other skills that you, you know, maybe you're not so strong in and that you'd be able to, you know, push yourself into getting better at something else? Yeah, I definitely have a like pretty big skill set, but reverse engineering is my main one. That and exploit development, because I just came from that, like that was my starting point. And just to ease into it, it in all my current jobs and fields, it's used and applied there, whether it's IoT, uh, protocol reversing or reverse engineering, a proprietary file format. It, it's all concepts, logic, and it's a really big field that kind of covers most of what I do. So I would say it's my most used skill and probably my favorite. Yeah, I'd say it's such a it's such an invaluable uh, skill to have. I would say, especially because uh, maybe it's different in America. In Australia, you're the first person I've ever met that's got such a specialty in reverse engineering. 
uh, as I said, you know, Max and I, our uh, experience with is doing basic capture the flags and stuff like that. But even just day to day life, I can imagine it's can be useful. Um, you know, you find Microsoft brings out another tool, and every single time it's so buggy, and you got to find out why it's so bad. Um, but yeah, I can imagine it's just a completely invaluable tool. Uh, you mentioned that you were an author, so I believe it's three books you've published. Yeah, um, three. I'm actually working on my fourth. Wow, that's that's crazy. Is <laughs> uh, so any uh, any like little hints, any uh, a sneak peek of it, what's going to be in, or is it all confidential? It, it is all confidential, all confidential. at least until <laughs> everything in the book becomes reported. <laughs> Got you. <laughs> uh, could you give us a bit of a rundown of? you know, the process to writing the book and also what is kind of in them. Are they all reverse engineering? Are they all kind of, uh, I don't know, maybe story-based? What What's the go? Yeah, so um, I, I get asked that a lot. Like a lot of people take an interest in like the process behind writing and designing and stuff like that. And for me, I have to say I didn't do any of that. I just, um, I, I had a really known friend uh, in the author world in cybersecurity and he referred me to KDP. Uh, and that's Amazon's uh, Kindle Direct Publishing Service, where it's like a self-publishing service. And I was like, all right, I already write like 80 minute articles in 20,000, 30,000 word articles. Let me just slap it onto a document and thought of some ideas, like what's not out there and the F it, let's just go drive in and make the book. Yeah, it sounds sounds good. But this, the, as I said before, I don't mean to be, uh sound like a broken record but at 17 years old that's crazy to me uh, growing up being an author was a dream of mine um and now i'm in cyber security is a bit of a different field so i think i may even try to do something like that in the way down the future um it, sorry you go, you go. no i was just gonna finish off by saying it's definitely great and um being an author in cyber security is is pretty cool because you get to create ideas and watch people like physically hold what you're thinking of and i think it's a crazy representation for the steps you take in your career yeah uh we'll also put uh your books in the description for anyone that wants to go and check them out uh so you know you, we did mention that uh reverse engineering is your best skill or what you're best at what would you say is something that you would like to improve in in the future? What is like a skill that you particularly think will be very valuable for cybersecurity that you want to go and gain? Mm, uh, something that I've really been working towards recently is uh, getting a, a much, much more broader hand on hardware hacking. Um, because that, that, as far as my field goes with IoT, I'm going to be taking apart um, or trying, sorry, needing to dump firmware in some way where I can't find it on Google or something or analyze chips for further information about the system and so on from there. It's just a pretty important skill. And I think it's, it's a really intelligent field because it takes a lot of knowledge in electrical engineering and how circuits work and so on from there. Yeah, is, I can imagine you could get very complex very quickly. Uh, IoT is, is such an interesting topic. Um, I, IoT, like, we saw, especially in Australia, I think it was global as well, is that everybody was like, oh, you know, why don't we connect everything to the internet? And then, you know, we figured out why that was a bad idea because, you know, we got massive botnets everywhere around the world. Uh, something Max and I have spoke about in the past is I think that this trend is starting to happen with AI now where AI is just getting put into tools that doesn't necessarily need to be there. Um, would you say you've seen that at all? I've, I've started calling it the AI Internet of Things just because I have saw this in a alarm clock application, which I was like, why do I need AI in that? But <laughs> Yeah, it, I, I definitely agree that it can be like, it, it, there's a lot of applications that we don't need to put in. And like Mercedes just put GPT, I think, in all their cars or a specific model of their cars. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, there's no way that in maybe a year or six months by the time that's out, someone's going to find something and be like, oh, because of this AI, I now have root access to the entire operating system of the vehicle uh, or smart fridge or toaster. It just, I feel like it's useless in a lot of applications where we're trying to make it useful. Yeah, it's more so that it makes the application sexy. It's a selling point rather than what do we actually need to use this? No, 100%. Yeah.
Uh, right, just another question. What trends do you see sort of moving forward in the next maybe not I won't say twelve months because you know predicting the next twelve months, you know, it's always a bit of a up and down game. Yeah. But maybe in the next five, ten years, where do you think that cybersecurity is going to head? Like, what direction do you think it's going to move to from from your perspective, obviously? It really depends on like the the way we're looking at things. From my fields of research, which is just primarily IoT, I see that now we're just starting to get to a level where we're trying to max out the amount of potential we can put in the device. Yeah. And the way we're connecting things, we're implementing it too fast without caring too much about security and just trying to push past like a regulation that states we have to get this standard secure yeah. um, or this system secure. And that's I see that moving in a negative way in the future because we're just pushing, pushing, pushing for things to get out, not caring if they're secured. And if all these systems are tied together, like pacemakers and other mm. health related devices, someone's going to find it and be like, oh, well, maybe I can send XYZ payload to this to get it to crash, fault or bust. And in that case, it's a human life at risk. Yep. Yeah. And yeah. I'm kind of see that like sort of the issue of an, you know, an APT where they can, you know, hold the ax right over your head with, you know, what if they were able to ransom an entire hospital or, you know, say we have control of X amount of pacemakers in your country, right? And that's that's a you know, that's even even more valuable tool than like a nuclear bomb really. We can just yeah. turn off yeah. half your population like that. Yeah. So you work in research. Research is something I have a bit of experience in, not particularly research uh, like yours. I was doing more academic research, so there was, I suppose, more of like a a process to how you did things. It was a bit slower, which was frustrating. Uh, my research was more around like AI and how we use that to uh, tackle scam callers. What would you say is some of the challenges you find with research? Like, for example, I found it frustrating because... I could work on something for six months and then it ends up being nothing. Um, what, are, what are some of the challenges that you find doing research? I think that that is pointed out exactly, uh, and I'm feeling that right now, is, is rabbit holes. They're, they're the mm. biggest thing in the world. I'm sitting here wasting days of not sleeping, trying to put like find a vulnerability or something. I know something's there, I can feel it, but I can't find it. And then a week later it becomes a dead end and it's like oh well it was a rabbit hole from the beginning and it's the most sinking devastating feeling internally for me yeah i completely sympathize it was the worst feeling ever after six yeah. months of doing work i'm like oh so what have you got Ooh, nothing i know it doesn't work <laughs> which i suppose is valuable insight as well because we know how not to do things or especially with yours as well. If you're looking for a vulnerability, you know, maybe that means it's a brighter side for the application, but it's, it's definitely still frustrating. Yeah. Cool. Uh, we might just go on the, um, on a bit of a question about car hacking. So I know like that's something that you're a little bit interested in with the IOT side. Uh, you know, Flynn and I both saw you're quite sort of proficient in it. Um, you know, it's a bit of a serious problem when you think of, okay, well, someone can just go and unlock my car, but how much do you think, like, this is actually going to affect the general public? Like, do you think that everyone should be concerned about, you know, manufacturers and the security they're putting into the car alarms, or is it more of a, more of a really kind of like a small, uh, a small sample size of, you know, uh, people that are going to be affected by the issue? Yeah, um... Right out of the way, I think it is a very massive issue, um, especially if we go back to the previous point. You know, we got to think car manufacturers are only here mainly just just make profit off of pushing out vehicles. Yep. They have compliances, regulations that have been in place for years, uh, but not much for cybersecurity. We have very few uh, regulations. We have current ones that are working on being in place, but uh, only like a select few that keeps that. And because of this, uh, the more threats are, are going to start popping up but as we start implementing more technologies and tying things together especially electrically slash remotely um with apis and cloud services and infrastructures and stuff like that it's just going to become more and more of a uh, pretty much a, a giant pool mm. of just vulnerabilities waiting to happen mm. and even something like um the tesla hack i think his, his yeah. name was david colombo he did that hack um and 
he was able to control Teslas and their music, their speakers and stuff like that. And that's where I see the dangerous side because some people think, oh, just speakers, whatever. But that is an actual distraction to a lot of people on a highway. So if someone's just brute forcing um, some payload just across the world, now you got all these cars just responding to the same stuff in a negative manner. It's a very huge, dangerous um, issue that, that I think needs to be prioritized. Yeah. And I, I think it's just funny, the uh, the idea of imagine you're driving along and then suddenly, you know, your speakers start just like blaring as loud as they possibly can for every single car around. Surely someone's going to like, you know, <laughs> mess it up and, you know, <laughs> crash into something. But no, no, that's, yeah. a, that's a really good point. What, um, you know, what can be done, do you think, to improve the security of, of car uh, locking systems and alarm systems and, you know, radio systems? Ways where there are, you know, endpoints to, um, to connect to the, the car's interface. Yeah, I, I mean, there, there is a, a ton of ideas out there, but cars are made up of so much that's mm. reliant on the people they're buying parts from. Because when they manufacture vehicles, most of the parts the manufacturer is going to be getting, especially for uh, like user interfaces or dashboards, those are all third party and they're all dependent on the people that test and regulate that equipment. But not everyone providing a saying like a I don't know, um, trying to think like a paid for radio station service is going to think that it's going to be put in a car and hijacked by someone. So we're thinking of like two different worlds and connecting all these different pieces that is just dependent on a person that makes the original equipment. Yeah, Yeah, I think that makes sense. Are there any ways like personally you you would look at, you know, say, for example, you owned a, um, a, a car company, right? And you inherited it and you you see all these you know inbuilt issues what's sort of the first few things you do to uh start combating some of the the blatant like security problems there yeah so some of the things i actually realized uh when i got asked that question um i looked at a rental vehicle as a ford yep. we had we took a trip up to orlando or something like that and yep. it had a whole infotainment console wi-fi cellular and stuff and i was going through the settings and i was like man there's a lot of stuff mm. on here that people can change like passwords you yep. can disable bluetooth allowed from any connections add cool lists that prevent certain devices from controlling Wi-Fi. Yep. Um, update the firmware because it'll give you firmware warnings if it's out of date. That's the best thing you can do as well. And just make sure your data is strong and you're not using it um, for anything too big yep. uh, or something that's super noisy, I guess. Another problem I've seen with car, it came out recently that a lot of cars are selling very sensitive data a lot of car manufacturers are selling very sensitive data that's coming through the car uh for example is even voice and video stuff like that with cars i don't know why you would even record video in a car but that's apparently happening um it, it's a very scary field of the uh, car industry in general especially when it's becoming more remote uh it's very scary um how would you say we educate the public education is something me and max are obviously very uh, passionate about considering we had the podcasts and stuff like that how would you say you would educate the public on the importance of this and to take it into consideration when you know going and buying a car yeah th- this is something I- i've thought of for about a while because i thought about just like going out and like talking about it publicly for people who aren't that aware of it mm-hmm. um but these days it's really about the way you're going to be delivering it and talking about the information of how to protect your car you know what's something someone who has no technical background going to learn how to do to secure their car. Um, Should they know about this? Should they um, say, should we tell everyone that, oh, some hacker can go hack and remotely control your Tesla? Because if it's delivered that way, then everyone's going to freak out, panic, Mm. and go boycott companies for no reason. Um, So really, I think the content, uh, the way it's delivered is how you would educate pretty much because if it's not delivered properly then it kind of topples and it doesn't come across right and people take it so wrong yeah i think it's a very you gotta skate on thin ice when you're doing it it's not an easy thing to do because as you said creating panics not what you want to do but also you want people to understand the risks that are involved uh off yeah. that as well sorry off that as well um so as i said Kerwin and this who connected us with you and you've educated him on reverse engineering. How would you, on the education piece again, how do you educate people that are, are trying to get into these more complex complex topics that, you know, sometimes they 
are quite hard to break into. How what's your approach to say with a Kerwin or someone like that? How do you sit them down and educate them about reverse engineering? Yeah, it, it's actually man. I've um, teaching uh, that kind of field. It, it depends on the person. Uh, for me, I've noticed I can't teach to some people because some people have to grasp things completely differently. Mm. Um, but for the general sake of it. Um, when it came to people like Kerwin, what I did was kind of just say, hey, let's explore some things. Reverse engineering is a, a lifestyle in a way. It can be because of how much is included. If we look at things from a different angle or we're trying to figure out the logic, that's all it is. So I was like, all right, let me just throw you in the deep end here. Let me scrap up a little C++ program for someone who's never touched any reverse engineering before and toss it at you. Yep. Um, how are we going to walk through this? What's the process? What do you think is important to find? Basically testing like basic human uh, methodologies for what's dangerous in an application and then taking it to a little bit more of a technical level, uh, explaining deep by deep. Typically, I do suggest that people before hopping into fields like this, um, they understand that like concepts prior to it like assembly like you can't be reverse engineering without some knowledge of assembly mm. um and it does require a decent amount of logical comprehension as to the way you go about things um but after that is pretty much yeah it's just exploring throwing yourself in the deep end and being like how can i mess this up yeah so i think it, it i think you hit the nail on the head that it depends on the attitude of the learner um uh yeah it, it's going to be very different person to person uh, so Ryan, just another thing, you did mention sort of how you got into cybersecurity and all that through, you know, hacking games as a kid. Um, can you, do you have any stories or do you have a, a story about how, you know, you're able to get some, get some cheats made for any, you know, popular games? Mm, yeah, I, I will, I, I will refrain from talking about the name because I, yeah. uh, over here, I, I can just by saying I can probably get sued uh, but <laughs> yeah no um, worries. so one thing in particular you're saying for like how to build them like how i built it for yeah. a specific game okay so my first game was probably one of the easiest games to hack it's a pretty popular multiplayer game mm. uh, it's anti-cheat sits on user mode which means for those who don't know the operating system there's different uh levels of privilege and your user mode is your least privileged yep. uh if an anti-cheat sits there it's not going to be able to sit much it's not going to be able to see actions or certain events because it doesn't have the permissions to do that programmatically um so i think that the coolest part about that experience reverse engineering that figuring that out and being like all right we're gonna bypass this anti-cheat by just going a level lower than what the anti-cheat is at mm. so Figuring out that it's that user mode, let's go to maybe kernel mode yep. and write something uh, that can bypass it easily. Um, I think that uh, going about it pretty much is just that. It's analyzing the environments, the anti-cheat systems, how are you going to get around it, understanding uh, what entry points and where you can go, and also how you can dissect the game as far as what debuggers you can use. Do you have to patch over security systems? Can you patch anything? Can you make any modifications? And so on from there. There isn't really particular thing in mind with that but basically all my stories kind of have the same weird ending it's just like okay we found this anti-cheat is using xyz so we're going to bypass it and then when we get to the game level we're going to create a handle and start writing data to it yeah uh, so we were sporking we, we were sporking <laughs> we were speaking a bit before uh we started the podcast about you know recent years we've seen anti-cheats come out that are almost too intrusive. Once again, I won't say the the game name, but what's your opinion on? So this first game you did, the anti cheat was so bad that you could basically do anything. Um, and then on the flip side, we've seen games that come out that are basically spyware that are looking at what you're doing to see if you're a cheater, but also that's also extremely intrusive and could potentially be malicious. What do you think is the the middle point of okay, this is a good anti cheat, but this isn't spyware? It's very hard to say because a lot of this information, uh, people complain and complain and complain about the kernel mode anti-cheats and stuff and mm -hmm. how they take information. But sometimes there's a lot of information that they collect that is needed to successfully ban hackers. Yep. So you're kind of like a lose-lose situation anywhere you go. There's no middle ground. It's either you're too high up and you're too low like on the operating system or you're doing too much or you're doing too little. 
Um, there is a, a great level in between, but there's a lot of stuff involved in creating the anti-cheat legally that I think a lot of people are misunderstanding yeah. that plays out what they can and what they can't do. Um, even if it's invasive, they might not be able to do something high level because it breaks a privacy law. Yep. It's it's really complex to say that, um, but I would say there's really no middle ground between it. Like, perfect. Yeah, I think you've said that perfectly. And at the end of the day, we're not going to stop every cheater that is the, the end goal. <laughs> and maybe, maybe it's a culture thing, but there's always going to be cheaters. Um, same thing yeah. with hackers. Like we try so hard to prevent hackers, but no mm. matter what, there's always someone that's going to be smart enough to get oh, around it. I don't know about try so hard. Maybe in America and Australia, we keep having this issue of very, very simple vulnerabilities. But that's a story True. for another day. Yeah, uh, we've we've said it to death on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Ryan, are there any closing remarks you have um, have for anyone listening? Anything you want to just bring up or put a uh, point across? Sure thing. Um, first thing is, uh, Kerwin, if you're watching this, thank you for recommending me and talking about me. You're too kind. Um, and two, for anyone willing to get into reverse engineering and stuff, um, or cybersecurity as a whole, especially younger, and I say this to a younger audience of people, um, that is, there's a lot of people that I felt coming into this world that were very, like, toxic towards age-related yeah. matters. They're like, you can't hack this, you can't do this and that. Um, but I will say to anyone, regardless, there are people out there that will tell you that stuff and even tell you X, Y, Z is not worth it, or it's a waste of time. But I promise you, even if it's, you don't get a vulnerability out of it, or you don't get whatever out of it, you still get experience. And I think experience is one of the most important things here. Amazing. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Ryan. We'll uh, talk to you later. Have a good one. You too. Thanks for listening. Just a reminder that the Cyber Minutes podcast is for educational purposes only. The views expressed by hosts and guests are their own, not necessarily their employers. Advice discussed is general advice. We promote ethical discussions, not illegal activities. Have a cybersecurity question? Send an email to cyberminutespodcast at gmail.com as we'd love to answer it. Stay cyber safe.